Brian the Blue, and welcome back to Current Calamities, where I take a break from the past to look forward to the future with the games of the present. And today we have a very special day ahead of us, as I'd like to introduce to you a little friend of mine. If you've never heard of this before now, you won't be alone. So I think the best course of action is to talk about how I first learned about it. So I first caught wind of this portable system back in 2019 when it was first announced, and it immediately caught my eye. Not only does it look like a Game Boy with its black and white screen and symbol design, but it also differentiates itself from that comparison with new games and a new additional control feature with a crank. A crank! Some may think this is how you power it on, but no, you can actually play games with this crank! So I was very much intrigued by the Playdate. It was designed by Teenage Engineering, who are known for their synthesizers, and being brought to the world by Panic, who you might know as the publishers of Firewatch and Untitled Goose Game, which I've looked at previously. Games would be released by season, having names attached like Kaita Takahashi, Bennett Foddy, and Lucas Pope developing for the system, and its unique look and style just ticked all my boxes, though it was definitely looking like it would be a niche product with no backlit screen and a price point of $150. But I didn't care, I'm all about the oddball games and consoles of the industry, so this thing is right up my alley. I kept tabs on the play date and was looking forward to pre-ordering it in early 2020, but we all know what happened that year that we all wish we could forget. Let's just put up the 404 page not found and move right along. So yeah, COVID did a number on everyone, including Panic, who had to delay the initial pre-order to a later date. But in between, the deal just got sweeter. The number of games per season increased from 12 to 24, letting us have access to two new games a week. More details were shared about how to develop for the system if you were an amateur or professional game developer, with lots more to come in the future. Unfortunately, the price increased to $180, but that's a bit understandable since you'll be getting more crank for your buck. So when it was finally announced that pre-orders were going up on July 10th, 2021, I woke up before 10am to be one of the first Playdate owners of 20,000. And after getting through the site crashing, I proudly became number 12,664! My cousin got it earlier than me. Damn him. It took another year of patience, a little setback in the battery department, and constantly looking at the Playdate Twitter page for updates to get me by. But when I got the shipping confirmation on June 28th, I was through the roof. And I haven't gotten down since. And after a few more days of waiting, my playdate was finally in my hands in time for the weekend. And I've been playing it ever since. I've taken my time putting this video together as I'm trying to give a fair, critical analysis on something I genuinely think a lot of you might be curious about. So I hope y'all enjoy this as much as I have, and keep in mind this has been filmed over the course of two months so my appearance may change slightly, but let's travel back to July 3rd when I first opened this bad boy up. In the early morning hours, I got a close-up look of the box and it looks so simple, shiny, and inviting with this little message on the back. I also got this little cover which costed extra, but it should serve as extra protection. I almost didn't want to open this up because it looks so nice, but I already know somebody out there is bound to do just that, so let's crack the seal and see what's inside. And what it has did not disappoint, as it had the unit looking so damn good in person, and this little have fun pouch contained the charging cable and a little message explaining how to get us started. But before we do that, we just have to take a moment to admire this little bit of gaming tech. You gotta admit, at the very least, it's cute, and I'm a little scared that I could crush it with my hand. I also like that the theming and friendly attitude extends to their documentation. Turning on the system, we have a rather impressive interactive opening screen that tests out all the buttons and inputs as well as getting us off to an entertaining start. But we gotta get serious and do a little setup stuff. Some of it I gotta do off camera, but we got to a point where I had to charge the system a bit, so I did just that. Let it sit, and we'll see how long it takes. While we wait, we can take a look at the cover, and it also looks nice and compact. Should fit right in with the playdate, giving it a nice mix of color. 
I didn't have to wait long for it to charge at all, and with a quick update and a few additional adjustments, we get introduced to the first two games of Season 1. We'll start with Casual Birder, where the main character looks a little bit like my cousin. Nathan, who you'll recognize in a few game reviews, pre-ordered his own play date. He got his a week before me, and I asked him to wait until I got mine so we can experience the new handheld at the same time. And that's exactly what we did on this day, and you'll hear his thoughts later on in this video. But he did get a head start on the first game because I had to download a critical update. What the heck, man? But I honestly don't think I miss too much. We're the new guy that's moved into town and gets involved in their bird photography competition. How the game works is like an RPG of sorts, and when you see a bird, you gotta take your playdate-shaped camera out, adjust the crank to focus, and snap a photo, and you've captured it on film. I guess you could call this a Pokemon parody, but this is either what those in the Pokeverse would play, or it combines the best parts of two Pokemon games. But even with that comparison, I didn't find this game very interesting, unfortunately. It's got a detailed and cartoony art style that gives a lot of character to the townspeople, but I don't think there's enough to really get me invested. And when you have to play an unlikable character like this... I can't identify with this dweeb. So yeah, we're not off to the best of starts, however there's one way we can make things better. Y'all didn't think I'd be playing all the games like this, right? Luckily the folks at Panic had thought ahead and gave us the program Mirror that you can download to your computer to view and record your Playdate gameplay. You can actually see your inputs on screen. I wish that was captured with it, but oh well. We'll be alternating between this and my amateur hands footage from now on, and let's quickly move on to the next and much better game in Whitewater Wipeout. This is a game I thought the playdate was meant to excel at. You have your little surfer dude catching a big wave, and you have to use the crank to guide him on this thrill ride and do some tricks for points. A simple concept that's wildly fun, but a challenge to get a handle on, especially at the start. You're gonna have to figure out how the crank is oriented so you can land on your board and not take a dip. That is, if you don't get dizzy from all these flips. As you go along, you'll figure out some additional tricks and goals to shoot for for bigger points, and in the weeks that followed, I got to be semi-decent at the game. If you want to call 30,000 points decent. But yeah, this is the better of the first two games. I'm sure others will take a liking to Casual Birder, and that's fine, but... Games like this are probably what the playdate is going to be all about. Now all we have to do is wait for the next games to arrive. And I didn't have to wait long, because the very next day on July 4th, I got a message I didn't think I'd get until later. I thought the games would arrive every week on the day you turn the system on, but I'm glad to be wrong on this occasion, because now I get to play... I was surprised this wasn't part of the first two games you'd get in the season, because if you have been paying attention to the marketing, this game is usually front and center, and it's for good reason. Kranken's time travel adventure is all about using that crank to guide Kranken the robot on his designated path to meet his date crank get while avoiding numerous obstacles and hazards. The trick is you're always late, so when you do get to her, you're gonna see some shit like this. Oh, rejected. I could literally do this all day. You'll get familiar with some of Kranken's habits when it relates to certain obstacles, but the game throws so many new ideas and hurdles at you that you'll have to keep a level head so you can progress. You can be stopped in your tracks by anything that comes into contact with you, like butterflies, birds, or even walking doo-doo, cause why not? So it might leave you guessing and replaying levels till you get it right. I've managed to perfect all 50 levels signified by the filled hearts. It definitely wasn't easy and it took plenty of tries on a few of them to make it within the time frame the level demands you get. One level even had me worried about how fast it wanted me to go. I hope I don't break this crank. It's obvious why this game was chosen to be front and center with the playdate, as it shows off what makes it unique and it's fun throughout and if it was sold separately, it would be the killer app, I guarantee it. So this is a solid game that everyone can get behind. Boogie Loops, on the other hand, massive misfire. This is pretty much the music editor from Mario Paint, and that's it. Some people might like it, 
But do you really think you should have followed up a masterpiece with something that'll take some time to learn? That is, if you want to learn it? No thank you. Well, we're two for four so far. A little disappointing, but the good games are really good that they make up for the slack. I spent some good and frustrating times with Whitewater Wipeout and Kranken's Time Travel Adventures for the remainder of the week before the next two games landed on the system. But before we continue with the games, I think we should address some criticism since we are having some issues on the software side, but there are some other things to talk about. The obvious fault everyone will be quick to point out is that the Playdate doesn't have a backlight screen. I can see where people are coming from as we are in a time where that should be mandatory on a handheld and it should be affordable to include, but I would argue that not having one adds to the charm. It's meant to be semi-old school with its one-bit screen that has stellar graphics, and I personally haven't had much issue with the lack of a backlight. Probably because I live in Arizona where the sun doesn't go down till tomorrow, and our trees are already burned up. I usually play my playdate in the daytime while en route to college, and that's ideally what you'll be using this for, as something to play when you have a break in between your daily activities. Games of course can range in length, but most can easily be played or complete in small amounts. And of course you can play this however you want, but from my experience, the backlight shouldn't be much of an issue, so long as you have a good light source. But let's go back to the games real quick. I like the idea of the games being given to us in a season-based manner, but I think Panic is missing the boat on how to deliver the games to later customers. Remember, games will be delivered to you once you turn the system on, and that goes for everyone. So you might be where I'm at now in Group 2, while everyone else in Group 1 has probably experienced all the software within the first season. So there is some disconnect to how everybody will experience these games, as it won't be everyone, everywhere, all at once. So I would argue Panic should rethink their strategy to how they tackle a season for later customers. Perhaps they should go from a weekly to daily dump of games, or at least have the games that are already out for a season out for new owners? This will more than likely be a problem for season two. Wouldn't it be better if all Playdate owners experience this together? That way I wouldn't be behind on talking about some of the new games that came in some time ago, but just came in for me. This week finally gives us two good games in my mind, and we'll start with Lost Your Marbles, a visual novel where we take the role of Prota, whom after testing Professor Marble's latest invention, literally loses her marbles and her dog, who we have to find. All the while meeting colorful characters and having to make complete thoughts by taking a marble and hitting these orbs with different answers, some being better than others given the situation or your opinion. Can't say I played anything like it, but I enjoyed going around Pomegranate Village and interacting with the locals who have some interesting personalities. I mean Proto's mom is a wrestler, and the inspiration is obvious. Finally! The game is short, but after the credits end, you'll see there are more endings and scenarios to go for, giving you plenty of replay value. So it's keeping my interest in this game high, and I'm encouraged to come back for more. I liked it. Pretty humorous and intriguing. Now I'm wondering what I should do next. Right, next game. Pick Pack Pup, our first puzzle game that has a cute style and a plot with topical undertones. You take the role of this dog who just got a job at this packing facility, and you're tasked with packing up goods within given parameters. I won't go into many details about the plot, but with each chapter you can tell who or what this game is poking fun of, but that doesn't take away from the overall enjoyment you'll have with the game part of the game. It's a simple match three puzzle game akin to columns or clacks, and you have to match as many items as you can among other tasks to keep going and get paid. Additional gameplay elements will be added over time to further differentiate itself from its counterparts, and you can try out a bunch of other modes to give you a change of pace or even more ways to play. Well, that was quick. This is a good puzzler that'll keep you busy with a relevant plot, simple mechanics, and an adorable protagonist. I'm more of a cat guy myself, but that's besides the point. Like I've said, we've got two good games as opposed to one solid and one stinker, so we're four for six so far. Let's see what next week holds.
The good games keep on coming with the fourth week, with these two being better than I would have initially thought just by the titles alone. Starting with Flipper Lifter, we have an arcade-like game where we use the crank to transport the elevator up and down to get penguins to their destination as fast as we can to keep the timer clicking. Getting the penguins to their floor will award you with more time and a star, which getting enough of will unlock more levels, and be careful with how many penguins you let on as it'll add weight to the load. Don't want to reach over capacity because that would be an unfortunate mess. The quicker you are, the more stars you get, and the more floors will be added to the challenge, and once time runs out, that level will conclude with hopefully your personal best. I do have one complaint on the second level in the mines. How are you supposed to know that you can transport from one end to the other from this section of the shaft? I had to look up where the area was because I could not figure it out, as I figured you had to be on top of this arrow in order to get across. At least that's how it is on the Tower of Terror in Florida. Please keep the ride the way it is, Disney. Don't do Rod Serling dirty. I'd recommend making that more obvious to the untrained eye, but other than that, it's still a fun time and a decent challenge that I'm still trying to tackle in its later levels, like how to not get this bird to munch on the penguins. Oh my god, no! This next game I think I'm putting the most investment in, Echoic Memory, where we're tasked with checking over these hi-fi AI sound systems for no real reason other than that's our job, but something sinister is arising as we're not allowed to interact with the sound systems or we'll risk termination, however they seem to be showing some signs of sentience and individuality. In between the plot, you validate these hi-fi AIs by matching short tunes to the appropriate sound modules. When you match them all correctly, the unit will pass quality control and you'll move on to the next. And I just have to ask, is there some conveyor belt noise that should be here? That has been bugging me for a while and I need to know. You use the crank to adjust the dials to adjust the audio module so you can hear the tune it plays better, and don't be deceived by how simple it looks cause it can go from 4 modules to 16 in a heartbeat. And speaking of beats... If I get content ID for this I'll be pissed. I could probably guess where the plot will take me, but I like the gameplay as it's very unique as far as I know, and it gets more difficult as you go along in a fair way. You won't believe how many fuses I've blown based on my tone-deaf ears. Well, we could go like this for a while, but there's a couple other points I like to get to before the video gets too long. Though if you're still wondering about all the other games I've been able to play in the last several weeks, here's a quick montage with some basic thoughts. Demon's Quest 85, not the game I thought it would be, therefore I was immediately disappointed and confused. Oh Maze, by far the very best puzzle game on the platform. If you play it, you'll understand why. Hyper Meteor, an Asteroids clone that's passable, but could be better. Zipper, Bennett Foddy brings us another game with his trademark challenge that requires patience and strategy, but this time it's fun. Executive Golf DX, golf in an office setting. Sounds fun on printer paper, but this is nowhere near what the golf. Questy Chess, an RPG chess simulator, mimicking old school computer programs, giving an intriguing experience overall. Star Sled reminds me of Quantum from Atari, and it's just as challenging. Saturday Edition, another game with an interesting plot that I can't wait to get into more. Inventory Hero has you managing a hero's inventory space for as long as you can, a funny concept, and Spell Corked where it looks like you manage a potion shop in the modern day, and it has tilt controls, the game keeps changing. Snack is like a combo of Snake and Nibbler, while Sasquatchers is a tactical turn-based game where a group of influencers go on a hunt for the cryptids, aka Bigfoots. So that's where they've all been. Good news everybody, I found them, but they're a bit... crooked. Those are all the games in Season 1 that I've been able to play thus far. Still have a few more to go in the season, so I'll look forward to the rest. But now, I'd like to highlight some of the other things that you can do with the Playdate outside of just playing the software. 
I mentioned briefly that this portable system allows anyone to make games, and I wasn't kidding as Panic gave us many development tools for any level of developer to toggle around with. SDK is meant for the more experienced developers, while Pulp has the laid-back or beginner crowd covered. Not only that, but you also have more tools like Caps or the previously mentioned Mirror, as well as additional resources and FAQs. I should also say you can purchase new games by other developers right now and sideload them onto the Playdate so long as you have the space. Just keep an eye on the Playdate Twitter or check your favorite indie website. I've never had a system that makes it so easy to create software for, so I'm very excited to try one of these dev tools out and see what I can make. I already have several ideas written down somewhere, and a couple would be ports but most are original ideas, and I'll get cracking on them hopefully when I get my hands on the stereo dock. Look how good that looks. It'll look better on my desk so I can show off to friends and family. One small screen in between two large ones. As I've said before, I wasn't the only one who has gotten familiar with the Playdate, as my cousin Nathan has had the same amount of time as I to play with Panic's new handheld, and he's going to share his experience with you right now. Take it away, cuz... Playdate. Little. Yellow. Different. The moment my cousin made me aware of the at-the-time, soon-be existence of the Yellow Bemo, I became intrigued. Never had I thought about using a crank to control gaming before, so maybe it was its cute and interesting design, or maybe I was intrigued by the type of games that could be made using the handheld unique features. Now that I own one, for the most part I'm very happy with what the Playdate offers. The handheld itself, though small, is comfortable to hold and using the analog crank feels easy and fun to use for most of the games. Now when I say small, I mean that this thing is thinner than a pack of playing cards and only as wide and tall as the palm of my hand. Initially, in the back of my mind, I was worried about how sturdy the little handheld could be. Thankfully, it feels very well built, and with the purple carry case, I was confident that even my clumsy self would have a hard time damaging this thing accidentally. I even brought the playdate with me to the happiest place on earth, and it definitely helped keep me happy while waiting or on rides I'm not a fan of. Tech-wise, the Playdate software is minimal but effective for the system, and the animations used give the handheld a cute personality reminiscent of Game Boy from the Captain N cartoon series. The menu can start to get clunky as you get more games, but the use of the crank can help navigate said growing list, and once you find what you're looking for, it becomes very easy to accomplish your task. Then there's the non-lit elephant in the room. It's been harped on in every video, and I'm fine with kicking a dead horse. The lack of a backlit screen severely limits the use of this otherwise unique and fun piece of kit. There have been times I'm playing and getting flashbacks to my childhood with the big gray brick, chasing light around so I can try and complete the level. That aside, the screen itself is beautiful and the games look crisp for how low res they are. Games! The biggest reason anyone buys a console. At least I think so. Receiving 24 games trickle release to your console included in the purchase was most definitely a selling point for this old nostalgia gamer who remembers the days of packing games with systems. And the variety of games. Oh my, the variety. From puzzle solvers to RPGs, high base score games to graphic novels, the abundance of different genres represented by the first season is outstanding, and many use the crank in a unique and effective way. And that doesn't even start to cover the plethora of other games you can easily sideload. Not all games are going to fit everyone, and I found myself migrating towards those that were quick pick-up-and-play types. The Playdate is an incredibly unique piece of hardware. While there are improvements that could be made, its overall functionality and design make it a fun handheld to take with you on trips or whip it out when you have a couple of minutes to kill. I'm very happy I jumped in and got this little thing, and I can't wait to see what new games and features get cranked out in the future. Thanks cuz, that was Nathan and he'll soon be starting his own YouTube channel and review series. I'll let you know when his first video arrives. And that's the playdate so far, an all around fun experience me and my cousin have been having. It's been so refreshing to play something completely different and original. Granted, it's what I do on this show, but it hasn't been to this extent in years, and it's only going to continue since I have two more games that came through as I'm wrapping up this video. 
Battleship Godios is looking like a tough-as-hell auto-scrolling space shooter where rewinding is encouraged and incorporated, while Forrest Burns is up in smoke, and he has to avoid the blaze coming towards him by platforming across the forest with his sturdy shovel, a la Shovel Knight. Will it piss anyone off if I say I've never played that yet? So with all that being said, what's my overall opinion? It's always a big risk to put money into something that isn't made by the biggest names in the industry, but this project had the most potential to be a success, unlike some other systems, so I'm glad this is turning out so far so good. The Playdate is very much a little system that can go places, with its unique presentation, original library, and a brilliant addition in the crank. If that isn't the only selling point, then I don't think this is for you, and it very well might not be for everyone. I've talked with other friends and acquaintances that I've showed the system to. They think the system looks cool and it reminds them of a Game Boy. Hell, I get asked if it's a Nintendo product. But when we've talked about it more, their biggest barrier would be the price point and a lack of a backlight. But I'm confident that the Playdate will continue to be something to keep an eye out for, so long as Panic keeps the support going. And who knows, there may be a part 2 to this when the next season rolls around. We'll see, just depends if there's a lull in other releases. I'm definitely going to keep playing with this and I'm looking forward to what the future holds for the Playdate. One of my biggest wishes is some sort of 2 player game to drop, I don't know if it's possible but maybe I'll have to make it so. So what do you think? Do you agree with me? Or have your own thoughts? Let me know by leaving a comment. If you like what you see, like the video with those thumbs up. If you think anyone else would like this vid, share it around. And if you want to see more of me, this show, and others, hit the subscribe button. I'm Brian the Blue. thanks for watching. I'm going back to the past, and until next time, I'll see you in the future.